A uniform disc is a lamina, so that means its thickness is negligible. The mass is uniformly or evenly spread throughout the disc. So the mass per any unit area of the disc is the mass of the disc, m, divided by the area, pi r squared. So r is the radius of the disc. The centre of mass of a uniform disc is at the centre of the disc. We want the moment of inertia about an axis that's perpendicular to the surface of the disc and passing through the centre of, ma of mass. We break the disc up into mass elements, delta m. Now we choose these mass elements to be concentric rings centred at the centre of the disc. So we can make those mass elements as small as we like by making the thickness of each ring as small as we like. Okay, what do we do to get the approximate moment of inertia of this mass element about this axis? Well, we multiply its mass by the distance squared to the axis. So the distance squared will be the radius of that ring. Okay, again we haven't taken limits, so the radius of the ring is a bit ambiguous because we could take x going from the centre to the inner part of the ring or x going to the outer part of the ring. But when we let delta m approach zero, as we've seen before, um, there's no ambiguity. The, this mass element becomes infinitely thin. So we'll get to that. Okay, we know what to do. We've seen this before. We want to write the moment of inertia of the mass element in terms of x only. So we use the fact that a mass element is proportional to the area. So the density doesn't change. So if the mass is delta m, we need to divide by the area of that element. Call it a strip. Okay, so this is a constant since the disk is uniform. If the disk was non-uniform, well, we're dealing with um, something that's not on this course, so I don't discuss that situation. Okay, so how do we get the area of this strip in terms of x and delta x? Okay, um, so imagine that we open out this strip. If we could open this strip out into a rectangle, what's the height of the rectangle? Well, we call the height of the rectangle delta x, so if x is the radius of the inner part of it, we increase x by an amount delta x to create this mass element. So delta x is extremely small and we'll let it approach zero later. So this distance here, the height of this rectangle is delta x. Now what's the approximate length of this rectangle? Well, that's the circumference of a circle of radius x. Well, you might say, what about this, the outer circle? It's radius x plus delta x. Well, you know, um, the circumference of the inner and outer part of this mass element will become the same when we let delta x approach zero, you know? So as it stands, before we take this limit, this is not really a rectangle. You know, the top part, the top part is longer than the bottom part, if you like, you know, if we open this part out, because the outer part is slightly longer than the inner part. But, you know, um, when we take the limit, uh, both top and bottom will have the same length. So we can take the length to be the circumference of a circle of radius x, which is 2 pi times x, okay? 2 pi t times the radius is the circumference. So now we can write down the area. We could call the area delta a if we like. So we just multiply the two sides together since it's approximately a rectangle and the approximation is improving as delta x approaches zero. Okay. So up here we can write 2 pi x times delta x and then we just rearrange to get delta m. So it's uh, 2 pi rho x delta x. 
So we've done this kind of thing a few times before. So the moment of inertia of a strip about this axis is approximately 2 pi rho x delta x for the delta m and we have to multiply this by x squared. Okay, so to get the approximate moment of inertia of the entire disk about the point C, we have to sum the moments of inertia of all the strips uh, about the point C. Okay, so this is an approximation because we haven't taken a limit. So we've seen this kind of thing before. We let we let delta x approach zero. Um, so the summation sign becomes an integral. Now 2 pi rho is a constant. That can be pulled outside the integral. Um, we have x times x squared, which is x cubed, and we replace delta x with dx. Now what about the limits of the integral? So we're taking the sum of the moments of inertia of rings stretching from x equals 0, the radius is 0, to the outermost ring. The outermost ring is at the edge of the disk, and its radius is equal to the radius of the disk, which is r. So we're integrating from x equals 0 to x equals r. Now we want this in terms of m, so we know what to do. Uh, we plug m, uh, m over pi, um, m over uh, the area of the circle for rho. Now take the limit here, uh, sorry, plug in r, so we get a quarter r to the power of 4, then minus sign with 0 in, well we're just going to get 0 there. So there we have it, the moment of inertia of a uniform disk, mass m, radius r, about an axis through the center of mass and perpendicular to the plane of the disk. Now let's consider a uniform annulus of mass m. So um, again this is meant to be a disk so its thickness is negligible. So I'm showing a plan view looking down on top of this annulus and we want the moment of inertia about the center of mass. Now the center of mass would be the center of both circles of course. Note here by the way that the center of mass is not part of the material of the annulus. So to do this problem we would just follow along what we did before. Um, you know we would take a mass element within the annulus. So this would be our mass element. Okay of thickness delta x all around. I'm just drawing this really quickly. Obviously it's meant to be a circle and uh, we'd follow exactly what we did before so we don't have to go through all that. The only change is when we get to performing this integral here. Instead of integrating from x equals 0 to x equals r, we would integrate from x equals the inner radius of the annulus which is b to the outer radius which is r. So the moment of inertia here is 2 pi times rho where rho is the um, um, density of the annulus, but integrating not from 0 to r, but from b to r. So, so all the mass elements would range from x equals b to x equals r. We'd have all these little rings of width dx, or well, delta x, and when we take the limit, the width becomes dx, ranging from x equals b to x equals r. Now there is also a change with rho. Rho is the mass of the annulus divided by the area of the annulus. So it's not m over pi r squared like it was before. It's um, what's the area of an annulus? Well we want the area of the outer circle which is pi r squared minus the area of the hole, the piece that was removed to create the hole. It's pi b squared. So we're going to get 2m over r squared minus b squared here. Now I've integrated this to get a quarter x to the 4 and I've plugged the upper limit in which is r minus a quarter x to the 4 to the lower limit in. Uh, that quarter can come out and we have r to the 4 minus b to the 4 here. Now notice that this thing here is a difference of two squares. You can actually write this thing as r squared squared minus b squared squared and that can be factorized. 
So that can be written as r squared minus b squared times r squared plus b squared. So there we have it, the moment of inertia of an annulus about an, ax an axis through the center of mass and perpendicular to the plane of the annulus. Now here's another method. What we could do is consider the moment of inertia of an entire disk centered at C. So, you know, the annulus is made by taking a disk, disk of radius r, and cutting out a hole of radius b. So let's consider the disk. I'll call this disk d. And uh, the piece that's removed to make the hole, I will call h. And its radius is b. So, to get the moment of inertia of the disk about the point C, you know what we did, we took concentric rings, our mass elements were concentric rings centered at, at C, and uh, running from x equals naught to x equals r, okay? x equals naught would be the radius of the innermost ring, it's just a dot, and as we move out, the outermost ring has radius r. And we summed all those rings. Getting the moment of inertia involves taking sums of all the mass elements times the distance of them to the distance squared of them to the axis of rotation. And we would be doing the same for the whole. Um for the piece um that you know that's removed to create the whole. So basically what we want to do is do the moment of inertia calculation for the disk and subtract out the moment of inertia calculation for the hole. Okay, because the process just involves summing quantities. So we do this for the disk and we have to subtract out for, uh, the moment of inertia of the hole or of the piece that um, that was removed to make the hole. But we know what this is from the previous part. The moment of inertia of a disk is half the mass of the disk times the radius squared of the disk. And the, the piece that was used to make the hole is in the shape of a disk, so we get half its mass. Right, mh for the mass of the piece that uh, was removed to make the hole, and its radius is b. Now, we want this moment of inertia, not in terms of the mass of the disk and the mass of the piece that was removed to make the hole, but in terms of the mass of the annulus, the mass of all this material here. So how do we do that? Well, we use the fact that the mass of the material that makes up the annulus is proportional to the area. Okay, so, um, you know, if we take a piece of the annulus and measure its mass, and if we double this area, we get a new piece that has twice the mass. So the mass is proportional to the area. So that means that if we take the mass of the disk and divide it by the mass of the annulus, which we'll call m. Okay, that's that m there. It looks like a big m, but I'll change it into a small m just to avoid any confusion mass of the annulus is small m. I could put a for annulus, but I'll leave off the a. Um, right, so the ratio of the mass of the disk to the mass of the annulus must be the ratio of the area of the disk to the area of the annulus. So uh, the masses have the same ratio as the corresponding areas, because mass is proportional to area. So the mass of the disk is, um, well, well, the area of the disk is pi r squared. And the area of the annulus is the area of the outer circle minus the area of the inner circle. So now we can write the mass of the disk in terms of the mass of the annulus. And of course we can do something similar for the mass of the hole. So what's the mass of the hole? Well, the hole is radius b. Well, the mass of the piece that, that's removed to make the hole 
So we end up getting that mh is b squared, well it's b, m, mb squared over r squared minus b squared. So we plug both of these back up here. So we have half of this quantity md times r squared. That's going to give us m r to the power of 4. And we minus a half of this quantity times b squared. That's going to give us m b to the 4. And you know we can factorize out this half m. Common denominator of r squared minus b squared. And on top we have r to the 4 minus b to the 4. We've seen that this is the difference of two squares. So these cancel out, and we get the result that we saw earlier. The moment of inertia of the annulus about an axis passing through the center of mass perpendicular to the plane is half the mass of the annulus times r squared plus b squared. Now let's get back to this uniform disk. Suppose that we wanted to rotate this disk about some other axis. Let's say this axis here. Make this axis parallel to the axis through the center of mass. Now, imagine trying to do this problem using integration. You know, we would be in big trouble with our um, mass elements being concentric rings centered on this axis, because what's going to happen, of course, is that as we get to the edge, our rings are not going to be circles. So the, the mathematics gets really complicated. And uh, you know, it's completely intractable to do it using integration at this level. But what we can use is the parallel axis theorem. So if the distance between these two axes is d, we can very quickly get the moment of inertia about this axis. So here is the parallel axis theorem. Um, so we just take a half mr squared and add it onto the mass of the disk times d squared.